so All right. right. While, while you're settling down, I'll uh, start yeah. with the introduction, and maybe he doesn't need an introduction, <laughs> but uh, we have Roger the Rabbit giving the last, I mean, uh, <laughs> it's a cat, it's a cat. It's a cat ears, okay. Yeah, it's a cat. Um, Andrew Bagel is from Microsoft Research, and he's been here the last couple of days, so many of you have met him. Many of you have met him before and collaborated with him or invited him to give talks at your events and institutions. Um, <laughs> And Andrew, for those of you who don't know him or haven't met him yet, uh, Andrew uh, does all kinds of software tools and inventive ideas to help with software development, both co-located and distributed. And on a personal note, I would like to say he's one of the most inventive and creative people I know and uh, has a very unique sense of humor. Uh, so with that, I will let, uh, let you give your talk today on uh, Biometrics. All right, thanks, David. <laughs> thanks, everybody. It's nice to be here. Um, I last went to ICGSC when it was in India in uh, 2008, and that was really fun. And I'm glad to be back here. Um, so, you might be curious about what I'm wearing on my head. Um, my talk today is about biometrics and affect, and what this is is a Nikomimi Cat Ears. It's a company from Japan that took technology from um, a company called NeuroSky in America that makes EEG chips. So that's electroencephalography, uh, which measures your brain waves. And so this lead at the forehead here is measuring the brain waves that are coming up, the electrical signal that's coming out of my head right around my left frontal cortex. And then there's a little earplug here for a ground, because it's a differential signal. And then they are interpreting those brain waves to move the cat ears around. And presumably, there's like a definition for this. I think they have two signals. One of them is called attention, one's called meditation. Um, and they're proprietary, so it's not clear exactly what they're measuring. But sometimes it makes the cat ears pop up. In the, in the video on YouTube, whenever the girl sees some guy walking down the street, but your cat ears pop up. <laughs> uh, so they're measuring some form of emotional reaction, which is you know, kind of interesting. And, some, and when you're really bored, the cat ears actually do go down. One flaw actually with the cat ears is that while you can see what I'm thinking, I have no idea other than hearing these servos go back and forth because they're not actually attached to my head. So um, I'm going to keep these on maybe for a few minutes, but they're going to come off because these are meant for very small people uh, with tiny heads. Um, and not for adult males from the United States. Um, so anyway, um, let me just introduce what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, basically, I study software developers at Microsoft. Uh, I get to work with them. I get to watch them work, uh, kind of like participant observation like we just heard from. Um, and uh, they complain to me about their jobs, and I say, that sucks. Um, I think I can help you with that. And I try to build tools that help software developers uh, do their job a little better. Um, so in the past, I've worked on social media for software developers, and these days I'm doing a lot of stuff on biometrics and trying to fix, not fix really, but I want to help individual developers help themselves to become better at their jobs and happier at their jobs. So really, um, my goals are the same goals as in software engineering. They want to increase <laughs> developer productivity, and <coughs> if developers are going to make mistakes, I want to make sure that those mistakes don't have too much of an impact. And since everybody does make mistakes, that's really kind of an important aspect of software engineering. Now, we've known in, for the past 50 years of software development, really, there's no silver bullet to making this stuff work. Um, typically, we have this aphorism that software developers cause one bug for every 10 lines of code that they write. It's probably somewhere in that ballpark. Um, it's certainly more than zero, um, and probably less than every line of code that they write. Um, but despite having all these great advances, like coming up with programming languages, or abstractions, or development tools, communication tools, uh, geographically distributed computing, agile practices, none of these things have been like the magic fix for the problems that we're having in our software, software code, so we're still looking. And that's kind of what I'm really looking for here as well. This is kind of the interesting part about my research. So I was inspired. Um, by the Mining Software Repository community, uh, which has the unfortunate acronym of MSR. And for people from Microsoft Research, a little weird. But um, the whole point of that community is to look for correlations between software code bugs and uh, 
the changes in the code and things that people did to the code in the repositories, uh, that might uh, be correlated with those bugs. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that you would look at churn metrics and say, well, if you edit your code, you're more likely to cause a bug, which is kind of a tautology since you can only cause bugs by actually like working on your code. Um, looking at code metrics like cyclomatic complexity, looking at organizational metrics like how far away are two people who work on the same binary from one another. Do they actually ever talk to each other? Because if they don't, you might have some trouble. Uh, looking at social metrics, do people actually know each other um, who are working together? Uh, how, clo how far away are they in the social network when they work together? So um, what they do is they look for all these um, uh, metrics, they compare them with where the bugs appeared in the source code after they shipped the product. So they wait like six months, figure out where the bugs were, and then correlate it to those things, and then figure out what are the places in the code that are potentially prone to be buggy based on those correlations. But you kind of have this problem in that you have to wait till you ship your source code and wait six months after the customer already has it in order to find out where the bugs were, which means you're getting correlations that are applying to the next version of the software, not to the past version of the software. And that's not necessarily the most helpful thing in the world um, to be able to fix things. And worse, you know, you're finding correlations, not causation. So finding out that editing your code causes bugs or is related to bugs doesn't help you like fix it because you can't just tell people to stop writing code because then you won't have software. So uh, what I'm looking for, I was, I was kind of you know, disappointed by this. So what I'm really looking for is, is there a cause? Is there something we can do that can actually get to what developers are actually doing at the desk in front of them, like that can maybe, maybe help us solve this problem? So um, I want to look at developer behavior. So individual developers working at their desk in front of their computer, what are they doing that's actually causing those bugs? So um, there was a nice paper from Sun Kim um, called Micro Interaction Metrics for Defect Prediction, where what he did is um, he and his students looked at uh, Mylan, which is a, an Eclipse plugin for uh, recording where in the uh, Eclipse editor you're going, and it stores that information with every bug. So that way a new person coming into the project can find out what files you're looking at to help them start faster at solving a particular bug. Um, and what he found is that when he looked at some metrics that were about clicking and then maybe highlighting some of the code or maybe typing, really raw metrics like click, click, edit, that correlated with defects in the same way that churn metrics and organizational metrics correlated with defects. Which means that if you could tell developers not to click, click, and then select, you could stop bugs. Which is awesome, except maybe a little too low level. So. Um, I'd like to do something similar. The fact that you can trace these things back to what the developer is doing means that I can trace things back to what the developer is doing. Maybe if I watch the developer, I can find out when something is happening that um, when they're writing the code. And that would be meaningful, and then I can change what they're doing and intervene in some way. So what I started looking at was the developer's affect. So this is the emotional state of the developer um, and what their cognitive state was, so their thought process. Um, as they're coding, and maybe there are some correlations there that I could use to figure out maybe, oh, uh, you're confused or you're stuck. Maybe that's the point when you're going to cause a bug. Maybe I can stop you, slow you down, maybe I can speed you up in particular cases. So I'm going to take these ears off. This hurts. Okay, yeah, we're taking those off. Sorry. I'll put them up here so you can, you can see the ears. Actually, I'll pass them around if you'd like to play with the ears. <laughs> Feel free. I'll wait for them to come back at the end. Uh, so um, what I look at are three things. This is the ABCs of software engineering. Um, so affect, biometrics, and cognition. And really, affect is the is all about emotion. So it's really how does emotion impact behavior. So if you're frustrated, if you're stressed out, I certainly can't imagine software developers who might be stressed out or fatigued by the work that they're doing or maybe confused at the time that they're typing in their code base. Um, we use biometrics like the kind that I'm wearing on my wrist right here. This is an electrodermal activity sensor. It's kind of, it's measuring the sweat between two points on my skin. And that sweat correlates with something called arousal, and I'll explain that in a little bit. Um, but I can use this sensor to detect it and uh, send that into the computer in real time by Bluetooth. And I can use that signal to uh, figure out what's happening with you. Um, 
Now this sensor itself is, this was like $300. I think the ears um, that are being worn right now in the audience, those were $70. There's actually a more professional version of those ears um, that doesn't have, that don't, they don't have the ears um, that are $70 as well from the RS guy. Um, I'll talk about more sensors later. Uh, and then the idea is that we take those biometrics and we use them to figure out well, what's actually happening in your thought process. Can we figure out what's happening? Not just your emotional state, but your cognitive state. And so we use other sensors like eye trackers to figure out what are you looking at on the code and on the page to figure out what's happening. So um, let me just introduce affective computing really. So um, the idea behind affective computing is we can want to study how uh, human emotions affect their behaviors by monitoring them with particular devices. Um, so it's pretty interdisciplinary. It's got a lot of psychology in it, cognitive science, neuroscience, uh, and computer science because there's a lot of signal processing involved and interpretation of what's happening. Um, Ros Picard is kind of like the parent of this field. Um, really, uh, she wrote a book called uh, Affective Computing, and there's a conference actually called Affective Computing um, and Intelligent uh, interfaces, that's the, sort of the main place where affective computing uh, research goes. And the point was to really be able to figure out how to build a computer system that could understand how a human was feeling and react appropriately to the system. Now, affect is measured typically on two different axes. This is something called the circumflex model. So what we've got here is uh, two dimensions. Um, the First dimension is the vertical dimension. That goes from sleepy to aroused. And the idea is that like you're awake, you're paying attention, or you're bored, you're just not really into anything. Um, hopefully, I would say probably in the audience here, we're probably you know maybe halfway down this, this chart uh, for sleepiness. Hopefully though, on the x on the x-axis we have um, essentially this is like happiness. This is how happier you are. On the right side is pleased, on the left side is miserable. Um, sometimes we use smiley faces to measure this thing, um, or at least to ask people how are they feeling. Some of you might have seen this in the airport bathroom. Um, at least the one in Seattle has these little buttons that you can push, like I am feeling happy about the state of the, cl the cleanliness in this bathroom today. Um, these teams uh, turn out to be super easy for people to uh, interpret. Uh, so they're good metrics to be able to use to understand what people's uh, emotions are like when you just want to ask them for a self-report. Now, what we do with that emotion is we play with sensors. And sensors are really all about um, playing with different devices. You record a bunch of data from people, so you put the sensors on top of people, um, attach them to their body. Usually you go for sensors that are not quite as invasive as some of the ones I've been wearing. Um, you get lots of huge amounts of data. You try to struggle to remember your signals and systems class back from college um, and your electrical engineering. And you spend time cleaning your data and analyzing your data. And then you figure out um, if any of this thing actually works or you figure it out. Because it's hard to get a lot of participants to come through a study. And then any time you pretty much analyze your data, you're going to overfit it. So you want to get more participants in your study all the time. Um, and keep testing and trying to build a, a signal processing system that could actually work for across multiple people. Um, so let me show you what some of the sensors look like. So the, the first sensor up there, that's a Fitbit charge. Um, so you wear it on your wrist like a watch. Uh, it's kind of like an Apple watch, um, but I think it does less. Um, and you walk around, it measures your steps. It's also measuring uh, your electrodermal activity. It's measuring your heart rate using a sensor on your wrist, which is uh, doing uh, looking for your pulse using a green and red light. Um, in the middle is a Microsoft Band 2, so we name things really cleverly, and which also has heart rate, um, electrodermal activity, a step counter. Um, it has a UV index checker, which I mean should be more obvious when you walk outside, whether there's UV or not, uh, if you can see the sun. And then we have the Apple Watch, uh, which also does the same thing. Now, on the, bottom on the bottom left over here, we have the, the, a Zephyr sensor. So that's a heart rate sensor that you wear on the chest strap. And this is, if, you, if you're a runner, this is probably pretty common. Now, uh, one of the things about the sensors is that when you're moving, the signal changes because the sensor is moving against your skin. And this, this is electricity, right? Like, you're going to screw up the signal. But it turns out, if you're running on your chest, it's not so bad. They have a pretty tight chest strap. Um, it's measuring the signal on your heart. Um, and it measures both the heart rate, 
like how many beats per minute, and something actually more important, which is the heart rate variability. So heart rate variability is one of these, um, it's the changes in the heart rate over time. And as you get yourself into like a stressed out situation, like a fight or flight type of thing, your heart rate gets really, really steady because that helps you run away or fight somebody. Whereas if you're calm, your heart rate can vary. So we can look for that using the chest strap. It turns out you can't really measure it using the wrist. It doesn't work so well. Um, in the middle, on the bottom, we have an eye tracker. So that's the Toby IX. Uh, that one's $100. Actually, now it's $120. Um, and uh, what that does is it shines infrared light from the bottom of your computer monitor onto your eyes. So it sticks to the monitor with like a little magnet. It's like a little bar. Um, and it shines light in, infrared light into your eyeballs and reflects off your cornea. And then they're looking for the reflection in some sensors um, that then can figure out like what angle your eye is at and where on the screen you're looking. And it works pretty well, actually. I'm using it this summer for a project. Um, on the extreme right is a Microsoft Touch Mouse. This is like a regular mouse we sell this thing. Um, but on the back of the mouse, like the Apple Touch Mouse, like basically it's just touch sensitive surface. It's capacitive. So I can press my hand here and stuff. And one of the things we found in a previous study uh, was that if you are stressed out, you change your grip on the mouse. And you tend to either squeeze it or relax, but you just you definitely change it as you're getting more and more stressed. I'll pass this around too. Actually, I'll pass around the, the uh, this Shimmer EDA sensor. So, do you have a picture of that? Let's see. I don't have a picture of this, so I'll pass this around too. But this is measuring the sweat on your skin. EDA was figured out. Um, the first real sensors for EDA were like from the 1850s, where doctors basically figured out if they put electricity across your skin, they could measure a current. And that was exciting. And it turns out you get really, really interesting data if you smack somebody in the head. Uh, you get a blip. <laughs> if you play a loud noise that was unexpected, you get a blip. So I'm thinking, oh, what if you see some really gross code? Blip. <laughs> That's the idea. Um, but sometimes you don't always see those signals, so you have to go a little further. Um, so on this slide, we have more crazy sensors. The first one is. That's a real EEG sensor. So if anybody, has anybody in the audience ever had a sleep study? Where like somebody watched you sleeping for the night? So I did that once. But basically what they do is they put a 64 lead EEG cap on, and it's kind of like phrenology. Basically 64 leads go on very specific spots on your head, and there's gel for each one of these things. It makes your hair kind of gross, actually, so we don't use that that often. Um, and there's 64 wires coming off of your head into a bundle that goes into the computer, and it's recording the EEG values everywhere. So each EEG sensor can only detect the electrical activity of your neurons about a centimeter around. So a centimeter around the sensor and a centimeter deep into your brain. I mean, that's still like billions of neurons, so you're getting a big signal, but um, it's certainly, it's kind of a fun signal anyway. Um, I don't, personally, I don't always know what to do with it, but there are MATLAB things that kind of do. Um, now the next one in the middle there is called FNIR, so that's uh, functional near infrared, and it's very similar to the EEG, except instead of just measuring electrical activity, they're actually shining infrared light into your head, which penetrates about two inches and then bounces back, and so you can see how much penetration there is, and that corresponds to how much blood flow there is to those parts of your brain, and blood flow corresponds to how much you're using that part of your brain to do any thinking. So by figuring out what parts of the brain are where, which people know about, you can then uh, figure out which parts are active using FNIR or EEG. Um, on the extreme uh, right side for you, um, that's a functional MRI machine. So it's typically used for car accidents, but you know, in the middle of the night when nobody's dying, you're allowed to stick programmers in there and um, figure out what's happening in their brain when they're thinking about a problem. And there's lots of really fun science about um, doing that. I'll talk about one of the studies uh, that was done a little bit later. Um, on the bottom left is a position sensitive chair. And it detects how you're sitting or slumped in your chair. And it turns out like if you're kind of leaning forward into the desk, that means that you're paying more attention. If you're relaxed, you tend to like pull back from the desk and slide backwards. Um, so you can kind of get a sense of what some of these affect is using the chair. That was built at Microsoft. That was an intern project a couple years ago. 
Um, on the extreme right, on the bottom there, is a, a shirt that somebody's wearing that has sensors built into it. They're called EMG sensors, electromyography, and they're measuring your muscles. So every time your muscle moves, you can record like an electrical signal on the surface of your skin that's from that muscle moving, and so you can then measure how they're moving their body around. And that also, you can figure out how that correlates with the particular thing you want to study. Now, there's also sensors that work on, based on software. So there's a video sensor that can do emotion, detec emotion detection based on your facial expression. Um, and so this one, this picture comes from iMotions, which is a company that sells that for like $50,000. Um, but we also just hired somebody from Affectiva who is, <coughs> knows how to do that as well for hopefully a little bit cheaper. Um, and people, it's very common that people do sentiment analysis. Um, so uh, where they read text from uh, online forums or question and answer sites, and they say, how angry are people? Or how upset? Or how happy are they? Uh, can we read into that and figure out what their emotions are based on what they're saying? And that turns out to be kind of fun, too. Um, so humans have a lot of emotions. Um, this is an actor. I found this online. Basically, it's a picture of an actor who's exhibiting different emotional states um, and actually used for training these emotion detectors. Um, they're, they're now trained based on crowdsourcing, which is a little bit more fun. Um, so you get a lot more variety in the emotions. But basically, they're measuring like where the particular muscles are in your face. There's like 47 muscles in your face that could be in different positions. And they can measure every single muscle and figure out which combinations of positions correspond to a particular emotion. Now, this is something that does tend to be culturally sensitive and uh, depends on where you're from, like how you're going to react to something. But a lot of this, actually, a lot of the emotions are pretty common across cultures. Um, now, I want to show off some of the projects that have been done, at least at Microsoft, um, in, in our research group. Um, so that use affect. So this first one up here is a cloth that's hung from some string. And that cloth has memory sensitive wire inside. So basically, whenever you heat it up, it crunches up. And that cloth crunches up because when people are looking at it, they're feeling upset or grossed out by the crunched up cloth. It kind of has this weird effect on people. And the idea is that they want to do some biofeedback. So if we're measuring your electrodermal activity to measure out kind of like how aroused or stressed you are or paying attention you are, if they, using mechanical force, smooth out that, pre that cloth really slowly, we can calm you down. And so your emotions tend to mirror the crinkliness of the cloth, which is kind of interesting. Um, the next one is um, a vest that has porcupine quills kind of built into it. And the idea is that if you're, you would put this on somebody, let's say, who's autistic, who can't express themselves verbally about how they're feeling, or they can't necessarily recognize how they're feeling, but they're feeling upset because you're getting too close. So the idea is that the sensors would detect that and then use, again, memory wire to make those uh, flaps pop up and look like porcupine quills so that everybody else would get the signal back off. And it sends the signal that they themselves couldn't necessarily send. Um, we also do a lot of stuff with self-report um, because that's sort of the ground truth of what people are feeling when the sensors are reading something. But it helps to know, are you feeling upset? Are you happy? So we ask people on like their Windows phone to just pick up and every 15 minutes tell us how you're feeling. Um, now, one of the other ones that's pretty cool is this butterfly. This is a butterfly also made from, you know, really everybody should get some memory wire because it's super cool. So that butterfly is made from memory wire and, and an artist designed it. You wear it on your wrist and it shows you how stressed you are by how it's flapping its wings. So the more stressed you are, the, the faster the wings flap. Which is, it's, so it's, it's not just functional, but it's pretty. So the idea is when you're putting sensors on your body, you don't just want to put on something functional. You want to put on something you actually want to wear. And that's artistic. We have um, an intern this summer from the Media Lab, and she's been doing um, uh, computational tattoos. So you could actually <laughs> design metallic tattoos to go on your skin that are like NSC antennas. And that could read signals, and you paste them like a little tiny chip on your hand, and then maybe you can light up some lights on your skin. I mean, that's super cool. Um, they built a project called Affect Aura. So this is a visualization to show you how your emotions have changed over, over a, a week period of time. 
um, or this is in particular per, per day. So the idea is that these circles change color based on your mood. They change their crinkliness or their pointiness uh, based on how upset you are at that particular time. And these are all gathered automatically while we're also logging things that are happening on your computer. So this is something <coughs> volunteers would come in and, and uh, volunteer to have their data kind of monitored like this. And then they get this visualization for free. Now, once we monitor people, we also like to do interventions to help them because the, part of the goal here is that if you can take somebody who's stressed out and de-stress them and help them relax, that improves their health. Um, and for software engineering, it hopefully improves their software. Uh, so that butterfly that was used to show how people are stressed by flapping, we put people in a car in a driving simulator and asked them to drive in traffic, heavy traffic, or drive on a street with like lots of kids that would run across the street. And we asked people, like, if you see the butterfly, like, how does that make you feel? <laughs> and they're like, yeah, well, the butterfly, like, I was stressed out by the kids running across the street, but when the butterfly started flapping really fast, that got me a lot more nervous. <laughs> so it's sort of a positive biofeedback, maybe not the best signal. You might want to go opposite on there. Um, we have some phone things that are detecting when uh, two people might be having an argument. And a buzz will come from your phone and maybe give you a message of like, oh, maybe I'm actually reacting to my kid who has attention deficit disorder right now. I should chill out. Or in, in this case here, these pictures are supposed to be ambient art that lives in your house, but they themselves are reactive to what is happening on the sensors, like on your kid or yourself. And the idea is that when you're just in an interaction in your home and you're getting upset with your kid, one of these ambient art uh, uh, displays would change a little bit. And you would notice that because you're trained, we told you how to notice that kind of thing. And you would notice it, but your kid wouldn't. And that way you could take steps to like maybe walk away, count to 10, relax, and come back in and have a better, more positive relationship with your kid. So, all these things we're trying lots of different ways to sort of intervene without necessarily making it super, super obvious that it's what's in your hand that's doing it. Now, I want to show off a couple things that are from uh, some of my fellow researchers that are, I think, are pretty cool and pretty <laughs> interesting ways where this thing could go in the future. So, one of them is from Christopher Parnon at uh, North Carolina State. He came up with an idea for basically detecting um, subvocalization. So subvocalization is basically when you learn to read, you learn by speaking out loud, and then eventually you learn to read silently and in your head. And it turns out when you're reading silently, you're actually learning to suppress the motor neuron that connects to your chin that makes your mouth move and your tongue move. And so there's an active suppression of a signal. And so it turns out you can record that signal by putting an EMD sensor um, on this mandibular nerve, uh, which is this picture over here. And the EMG, remember, records muscle action. And it turns out, when you're cognitively loaded, you're not as good at suppressing the motor neurons uh, for your mouth when you're reading. So if you're reading something really difficult, it's not like your mouth is actually moving, but it's almost moving, and you can actually detect the increase in, in electrical signal and detect that maybe something is going on there that's causing you to get uh, uh, confused or, or uh, you find something quite difficult to understand. Um, now that one's a little invasive because you do have to like attach sensors to somebody's neck, which is a little gross. But you know, why not just try this, which is more fun. Um, so Chris Parnin and also uh, Janet Siegmund from Germany, um, from Passau, formerly from Passau, very recently formerly from Passau, uh, did this study where they put programmers in the fMRI machine. And what you can see here is um, this is the, the person, and then on top of it is a mirror. And so an fMRI machine, you can't have any metal in it, so it's not like they can do any programming in there. But um, the idea is that you would shine a projector on that mirror so that they can read something like source code. And you ask them to read this source code for like a minute, and then you look at the brain waves inside and figure out like what parts of your brain are lighting up based on what parts of your brain are being used. So it's measuring the oxygen level in the brain. The parts of your brain that are being used have more oxygen. It takes like 20, 30 seconds to really get a good signal. Um, but then you can tell, in fact, that some part of your brain is really um, being used and what parts of your brain are not. Now, you have this slight problem in that you can only really do comprehension. 
because if you move, like your finger, you're lighting up a part of your brain because the motor section of the brain has to light up in order to make your finger move. So um, all they can do is basically just comprehend code and hope that the, pro hope that the programmer inside is actually doing the task. Now you also have this other problem in that if your eyes are open, your entire visual cortex is active. So there's not really that much you can tell about where they're looking. Uh, some people are actually now starting to uh, connect eye tracking into fMRI. So you could watch where people's eyes are going on that code and then figure out if that correlates with some of the fMRI signals. Now one of the interesting things from this study that they reported at ICSI a couple years ago was that people were curious about whether programming was more like reading or more like math. Because everyone, everyone says you need mathematical skills to, do, to be a good programmer. And so what they found actually is that the reading part of the brain, the part that does um, linguistics and understanding, that's the part of the brain that lit up when they were looking at that code. It was not the math part of the brain, it was the math parts of the brain. Basically there's a website you can go to called the Brain Atlas that everybody does an fMRI study, reports their results there, they say what they made the participant do, and then what parts of the brain lit up. And so you can figure out basically uh, these parts of the brain lit up, what kind of activities cause those to light up, and then they can see what the relationship is. And so that was kind of interesting, that programming is more about reading than it is about math. They're continuing to do further studies now, um, and where they change the code, they obfuscate the code so it's not easy, so easy to read. Now, one study I'm doing uh, this summer uh, with my intern, Sarah D'Angelo, uh, who's sitting right here, uh, is a study looking at how to make remote pair programming more like co-located pair programming. So in co-located pair programming, you're sitting next to each other. One of the things you get from that is you get to get all the body language. So you can tell where somebody's looking. You can tell what they're working on. You can also, um, you see this in the language that they use because they're like, oh, <coughs> yeah, can you get that? Yep, that over there, right, okay. And if they move their mouse, they just know that you're both working on the same thing. It turns out to work even if you have two separate monitors in the mirror that are next to each other. Uh, so what we're trying to do is make that work in the remote setting where the problem is that you can obviously can't see the other person. Um, and even if you see them in a little tiny Skype window, it's just not quite the same. So what we're doing is using eye tracking uh, to figure out where somebody's looking on the page and we send the eye tracking information to the opposite computer. And we show you on the little green bar, which is sort of vaguely present here, where the other person is looking. And we change the color of the bar when you're both looking at the same spot. So that way you know when you're both focused on the same thing. We think that should change the language that people are using, make it a lot easier to understand that you're pointing at the same thing, that you're making reference to the same objects on the screen. And hopefully get a little bit more uh, facile that way. Our first experiment uh, is on Monday, so wish me luck. Um, now, the goal here is kind of, has anybody heard of the quantified self movement? Like a couple people, I mean the idea is basically, if we put sensors on people all the time, we can start measuring what do humans, how do they feel, how do they behave, how, do, how many steps a day do they walk in general across lots of people. So we want to do something similar. We just want to make the quantified software engineer. So we'll put sensors on. This is Hana, my intern from two summers ago. She's wearing the ears and a very lovely pair of infrared blocking glasses, which is helpful if you're doing a study with eye tracking, which uses infrared, and you want to stand behind the subject. Because eye trackers don't like it when they see more than two eyes um, at a time. They prefer just two. So uh, this helps the researcher be able to look inside there. Uh, now this is my intern Sarah, we've updated our blocking glasses, which is better. Um, and this is kind of actually what it more looks like. This is Titus, who's a student from uh, North Carolina State. Um, he's using some of the sensors at, uh, for a study from last summer. Now, we have kind of a bigger picture research agenda here. Um, so, number one is sort of this question of like, do biometric sensor readings like correlate with developer ethic and cognition? Like how exactly does that happen? What does the signal look like? How do we interpret it? And what is it dif what's the difference when they're doing different tasks? Um, so these are kind of like basic measurements we kind of have to take. And can we infer very well like any of these particular affective states like confusion or frustration or flow? Now there's been some papers at ICSI in the last couple years all about that. 
um, that have started to explore what we can do with machine learning. Now, one of the other questions that you will have to ask, though, is that, okay, so I gave them one task. Can I use the same kind of interpretation, the same sensor um, analysis for a second task or for a second person? So it turns out lots of these sensors, they read totally different things on different people. So that electrodermal activity sensor, it looks different on people from every different age. Gender changes it. How fat you are changes it. It's like, basically, I can read the signal for you for a day. I'm pretty sure it's relevant over multiple days, but it probably isn't relevant over a year. Like, I don't think I can compare your signal from today to your signal from last year. So we have to figure out ways that we can compare this thing. We also have to look at also different cultures to see, like, how are they reacting differently to the same stimuli. Um, and what we want to then do is figure out, okay, so I can tell you that you're feeling something right now. Well, what kind of longer impact does that have on your code? Does it have any impact on your code? Like, if I can tell that you're confused, okay, so I've, I've actually watched developers for five minutes at a time, and you can see within five minutes, they're confused about navigating through that code at least two or three times, where they're just like, I've watched one developer just sit there with their mouse and just kind of wiggle it back and forth over two different tabs, and he's like, I forgot what, fun, what file I was supposed to be in. <laughs> and then they, then they remembered, it only took like two seconds, maybe three. Um, but they clicked. They did the same thing actually while typing. He typed something, backspaced the thing, and then typed the exact same thing again. I kind of it kind of looked like stuttering, where like the brain hasn't caught up to what the body is doing, and so there's just not enough input to make it work. Um, eventually, they slow down long enough. But really, if I were to monitor, let's say, a whole team of software developers for months, and then take a look at where the bugs were in their code or where the productivity slowdowns were then I could maybe really say for definitively that these sensors are really going to be useful in practice. Um, and once I do that, I want to build some classifiers so that I could do this kind of detection in real time and build real time interventions. Because um, I want to be able to help developers understand their code better. I want to help them uh, stop them from causing bugs in their code. Um, and that would be ideal because if the bug never enters the code, it costs nothing to fix which is super sweet. Because a bug that if you wait till I ship costs a huge amount of fix. So the earlier in the, in the cycle we can stop it, the better. Now, the, we, we have brainstormed some kind of interventions we want to do. Um, so let's say that I get a developer who's really stuck on something. Maybe I give them hints from Stack Overflow. Or maybe um, a lot of software developers, when they first started the company, have a mentor. Maybe I give a signal to the mentor, you should stop by your, your um, mentee's office and just say hi. How's it going? Because maybe that's the time when they might need some extra help. Or we can also detect flow. So a flow state is when you're in the zone, when you're just like getting stuff done really, really quickly. And um, it's difficult for you, but you're making a lot of really good progress. So you feel accomplished at the end. So if you detect that, maybe you could tell people not to interrupt you. So this is something like from James Fogarty's research from Kai, like from, from 10 years ago, all about interruptions. And how do you tell when somebody's interruptible? So we could use the sensors for that. That would be kind of nice. Um, there are some people who are using eye tracking to figure out how do expert developers look at source code? Because if they look at particular, they look, would probably be efficient and look at only the important <coughs> words in a function when they're asked to summarize it. So if I could figure out what they're criteria they're using to figure out what those important words are, then I could also build this auto summarization tool that would be a lot more effective than existing ones just based on like LSI type techniques. Now, um, we can also use eye tracking to figure out what kind of code, how comprehensible some code is, or how readable is it, how maintainable is it. So code that's not readable, that causes people cognitive difficulty every time they look at it, is probably a really good candidate for refactoring because it's probably the place where people are losing a lot of productivity and trying to understand something. Especially if they didn't write it, it's probably really bad. It's, it's actually worse if they're the ones who wrote it. Maybe six months ago you wrote something really clever and it was too clever by half and now you have no idea what it says. Uh, and it takes you a long time. So maybe this is the kind of thing you want to use as a signal for some kind of cognitive complexity. And Again, the harder part, which is the part I'm kind of really going after here, is 
if I can tell when something is difficult for you, um, maybe I can stop you from coding at that moment. Maybe I can give, give you reason to pause. Maybe I could give you help and say, oh, I think this documentation file might be helpful right now. You could read that, and then that might help you with the code that you're working on right now. Or if you decide that this stuff is super fun and you want to get involved in this research, you could try to come up with cool things like that too. Um, so what's fun about the work for me is that this isn't just engineering, this is a lot of science. And I haven't really done science since like college. And for the most part, I mean, studying people is really fun, but it doesn't feel like I have hypotheses and questions and, and I make observations, I guess, in this kind of science. But like, this is sort of, <coughs> I have a signal that somebody gave me that like comes from a person and I have no idea what it is, what to do with it, or that there's a theory that says anything about that signal. And I'm the one who has to figure that out. And that's like super fun. Because it means I can do a study and I don't know the answer yet. Like I don't even know it at all. As opposed to like intuition and stuff that we get from studying software developers by watching them work. <coughs> or figuring out like, you know, how, they're, how are they communicating? I can get the idea if they're yelling at each other, they're probably upset. And I could do some analysis to figure out that they're upset for sure. But I get a signal that j that's really jaggy. It's like, maybe they're upset. It could work, maybe it doesn't. So I kind of divided up the hard parts here into five challenges in that, that we face in trying to build these kinds of tools. Um, the first one is um, I had to go back and remember all of my electrical engineering knowledge back from college. And thank God I went to a college that taught me any electrical engineering because this is all signal analysis and signal processing. Time series analysis. I had to like remember how to design an experiment. And that, for maybe a lot of people, might require some classes that people take and then figure that out. Luckily, at Microsoft Research, we have a lot of people who do electrical engineering and signal processing. So I just walk around the halls asking questions all the time when I don't know what I'm doing, which is all the time. Um, so here's an example. So this is uh, a signal that comes from electrodermal activities from that shimmer sensor I passed around. Um, so the one on the left is a participant doing eight different tasks. They're sort of from here to here. Um, the signal goes up and down. Generally, it jumps up to the top when the participant started their task. This is high arousal. And then gradually drops as they perform their task, which is, a, which is like a code understanding task. Um, and then it jumps up again at the next task. So I kind of have a basic sense of what's happening. Now, when I look at the signal from the next person, it looks a little different. So I look at this and I'm like, um, what's wrong with that signal? It took me a week of actually staring at that, of those numbers to realize the scale on the right axis, on the y-axis here, is a lot smaller than the scale on the left axis. One goes from 0 to 3 microsiemens, and the other one goes from 0.1 to 0.6 microsiemens. It turns out that was noise. The sensor didn't work. <laughs> like, it just didn't record anything. And it just recorded basically an increasing signal. The reason the signal increased, the subject had his, uh, his sweater down on his sleeve, which was covering the sensor, which is a wrist-based sensor at the time. Um, and that, that increase there is because of the temperature of the sensor rose over time. And <laughs> Fortunately, the sensor had actually a way to tell what the temperature of the skin was. And I was like, that's funny. It seems to correlate with the temperature. How weird. So I had to throw away three out of 15 participants' data from the EDA because it didn't actually connect. And one of the problems, actually, there was like two people who were super hairy. So that sensor like leads actually didn't connect to their skin, no matter what I could do. And one person was this woman who didn't sweat. And when you have an EDA sensor that's supposed to be measuring sweat and the person doesn't sweat, no signal. So that was frustrating. Um, but I learned lessons. Now I make people do jumping jacks before they do their study because it gets them like their, their juices flowing, literally. Um, now, other problems I'm seeing in the field that are challenging for me is basically because the human body is crazy complex. Uh, we need tons and tons of standards in how we actually do these studies to make sure that I can compare across different studies that I read about in conferences. Um, how many study subjects do you gather? Well, this is sort of like the same kind of questions that are going on right now in the field of psychology for figuring out replicability of your study. What kind of p-values are good enough? 
there's lots of challenges in data cleaning. Um, like I said before, you have to even recognize when you really have, do have data and when you don't. Um, there's lots of fun signal processing questions that I deal with and statistical tests and, met and machine learning. I'm not good at machine learning. I'm, I will freely admit that. I just barely figured out my statistics. Statistics was the class I slept a lot in in college. Um, and uh, I've been learning a lot in the last couple of years. So I now can do my stats, but my machine learning is still iffy and it still looks like magic. Uh, every time I ever come up with something in machine learning, I feel like I'm overfitting. I probably am. Um, which, for me, I've been learning some techniques from the other people at Microsoft who actually, there's a whole machine learning research group. So I talk to them and they're like, oh, you probably did this wrong. You should use boosting, or you should resample, or you should get more participants for your study. Because like, that 15, that wasn't enough. And you know, then it becomes more challenging. Uh, but it's fine anyway, I try to figure that out. Um, so here's actually a challenge that I found. Um, I have a pressure sensitive keyboard. I didn't bring it today. But basically, it knows how hard you push on the keys. And I figured this will be awesome. If a programmer is stressed, he's probably going to push harder on the keys. Like, you know? So I wanted to design an experiment to figure out, well, what, how do I tell when a programmer is pushing harder on the keys? So I have this idea. Generally, the pressure will be higher. OK, so then I ran into a problem. Um, what does it mean for the pressure to be higher? Like, do I equate all the keys? Because I mean, my pinky hits certain keys at a certain pressure differently than my forefinger. So that's probably not the same. So I probably have to distinguish which finger is hitting which key. So let's say I'll just make a separate model for every single key on the keyboard. OK, well, some keys I hit with two different fingers, depending on how I type. So I'm sure other people do that too. And um, I'm sure the, the, the pressures will look different. Um, once I do across keys, actually, I have this other problem. How often do you think you hit the F key when you're coding? It's maybe like once a minute. I mean, F isn't the most popular letter. Z is pretty unpopular. Like, there's a couple letters you hit a lot, like the A and the E, but like most things you just don't touch. So now I'm getting a signal that I'm like, well, I think stress comes on really fast. You get really, really angry within seconds. And the problem is the last time I measured that value from the keyboard, like for that letter, it was like a minute and a half ago. And the next time we're going to see another one is another minute and a half. So now I have a three minute gap in between I thought you got stressed out for 10 seconds, which is kind of a challenge. So I'm not really sure what to do with that. I have not used this in the experiment yet. I also have no idea if people all type the same way, which they probably don't, uh, or get stressed the same way, which they probably don't. Uh, so fun, but challenging. I'm still working on it. <laughs> Um, now, another thing that, I, that seems to be a challenge for us is basically figuring out how to replicate any of these experiments. So like I said before, every time I build some of these classifiers, I'm pretty sure I'm overfitting whatever I'm doing because play, basic like uh, stats isn't coming up with anything good. So I try the machine learning and it says, oh, you've got 83% precision and 99% recall or something. And I'm like, well, that's awesome, right? And then I discover a bug in my code and I'm like, oh, 82% precision. 96% recall, you know, and the numbers just change magically. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, I do totally for help, but uh, I do know that there's lots of trust and validity in all my experiments, and if you screw something up, like you had subjects that were too hairy, like, you don't have data. Like, you have to start over again. You can't just say, well, that was a threat to validity that some of my subjects didn't, their signal didn't work. Oh, okay, so. We'll go back, try again. So it seems to take longer than a normal study where I study software developers, at least longer than I'd like it to take. Um, so you just try again. I'm going to show you some, some uh, examples of how hard it is sometimes to figure out what's happening. So let me give you two examples of some code I presented to my uh, study subjects. So these two pieces of code kind of do the same thing. Um, which one do you think is harder to understand? The one on the right, why is that? Object, object versus circle. What, so there's a variable named object and a variable named circle? It's obfuscated? Yeah, so that's exactly it. Um, it turns out obfuscation inhibits comprehension. And the way we were able to tell this is weird, though. 
So it turns out that when you have the obfuscated variables and you're reading the code, we use the eye tracker to tell where you're reading. What we saw the people do is in the, in the example on the right, they would go down and read graphics.draw object X, graphics.draw object A, and then when they got to graphics.draw object B, they had to jump back up and find out what object B was. And then they looked at object K and they had to jump back up to look what object K was. And that extra increase in time was exactly the difference in difficulty level that they were reporting. They were on the left side, they just read T2 and they're like, in their heads, they knew T was triangle, C was circle, S was square. So they didn't have to go back. So the incredible increase in, in obfuscation time is you're basically overloading your short-term memory ability to remember these, op these bizarre names, and you have to go back and read them again in order to refresh them in your memory. So this happens in normal code all the time when somebody didn't name something so well, and you have to go back. And this is where Hungarian notation came from, the idea that you can name your variable with the type of the variable in there instead of having to go back to the definition to figure out something was an int versus a double. Um, that's the kind of thing that seems to be happening. Um, we have another one. So in this case, uh, which one was harder to understand for you guys? The right one. <coughs> so the code on the right, that I heard somebody say, why? It's putting together, here it's, it's divided, divided into two pairs. It's not as clear. Yeah. It's not as clear. So it does the same thing. Yeah. It's exactly, the computer doesn't care. It's exactly the same code. Let's say, I bet this one's optimized. You know, um, some clever coder came along and fixed it so that it runs faster. But it turns out, yeah, the one on the left is easier than the one on the right because I have two rectangles here. I initialize the entire first rectangle before initializing the second rectangle. And the one on the right, it's technically correct, but I initialize them all mixed up and jumbled. Um, that turns out to be increases your difficulty as well. And you can see it again with the eye tracker and that their eyes go everywhere. Whereas on the left, they just read them in chunks and they seem to understand it and then they move on to the next chunk and they can understand it. So even just organization is visible with the eye tracking stuff, which is kind of neat. So you can really figure out some measure of this kind of cognitive complexity. So um, what we need here is better tools. And let me show you another example of somebody reading source code. So that yep, uh, red circle there, that's where their eye is looking. And the blue is like a trail. They were asked to tell us what May did. I think they're reading the area function. Now they're on height, now they're on the constructor. Now back to height, now back to constructor, now back to main. Now back to the constructor, to height, to area. And up again, this is real time. Okay, what was that person thinking? I was so Variable names. Prepping the variable names, understanding what was that. Uh -huh. Trying to understand that. See, that's what we'd like to think. It's very <laughs> compelling. I really like this for a reason. Um, I like to watch the eye tracking videos because you can kind of get a sense of what is happening, what you think is happening. Now, what do we know is happening? At the very least, we know the places on the screen where the person looked. Okay, for sure, that's objective. Okay. Then I think there are some patterns, like the person read a line of code, or maybe the person looked like they went up to the constructor and they read through the constructor and then jumped back down. Or maybe they did something like they went from x1 in the main method to x1 somewhere up in the constructor. That's kind of exciting. That's like a def use kind of chain thing. So I can come up with explanations for what I think is happening. And then at the top, what we try to come up with are strategies for like, why did you do that? Why did your eye move from something that looks semantically legitimate? Why, in fact, are you debugging? Are you tracing the code? Are you doing a backwards control flow to figure out where something was defined? Like, there's all these questions that we have, and when we ran, um, we, I went to a workshop called Eye Movements in Programming uh, that was run at the University of uh, Finland in Eastern Finland in Yonsu. Um, and we had 12 researchers and we had 12 completely different explanations of what the person was doing in just that video that lasted like 30 seconds. And none of us could agree, which means we need to work a lot on methodology to figure out how to write objective, objective ways to describe what a person is doing and what they're thinking as referenced by the eye tracker. So 
Um, we need a little bit better tools, so what we do is we classify pixel locations on the screen, which isn't the most helpful thing when you're talking about code. Um, what's better is when we try talking about like blocks, or we name the block by the method that you're looking in, or the sub-block, like you're looking at the signature of the method. Um, what word you're looking at, those are all super helpful. We have actually tools now uh, that are out there to be able to automatically do this kind of lowest level of analysis. So at least when you're working with the data, you're not working with the lowest pixel locations and doing a huge amount of work on your own. So again, we're just at the beginning. Um, one of the things that we also do is we do visualizations of where somebody is looking. So we're kind of in this cognition part of the talk. It's almost over. Um, and just, you know, A, B, C. Um, so in here, we have four different visualizations of what the code looks like. And the first one is a basically a Markov chain. The idea is that we're, we were in the main method, and 70% of the time, the next thing we looked at was the height method, or 20% was the area method. Um, or we went from the height method to the constructor and then back over to the width. So it's a little visualization. Maybe it can help you try to understand what the person is thinking. The other things that we do are we look at where their eye movements were and how long they fixated on certain parts of the code. Now, it doesn't turn out that like staring at a particular line of code help, like, is measuring any sort of cognitive load or any sort of difficulty, but it does give you a hint about where they're actually spending the most amount of time. So generally, if they're rereading the same function over and over again, it might not be difficult, but it just takes a while to process it in their head. Maybe they actually are doing some kind of computation or tracing. Um, we have other things where we look at fixations by line, and you can sort of see these patterns. This pattern here, from one down to line 21, was something that we saw in a whole bunch of different subjects, where somebody basically read through the entire code base like it was a book. They did that when they started, and then when they were asked um, to find things in the code, they would jump around, and they, somehow they never had any problems finding where a function was. So we think that first pass, where they're reading the entire code like a book, was uh, used for the spatial map that's in your head. So figuring out like where everything is and putting it into a map. And that way, when you jump around, you just know where you're going. And we know that, um, there's been other studies that look at spatial memory, and it's a very really strong um, uh, indicator of uh, how well you know a particular program. So I want to ask now for volunteers. Actually, no, more like collaborators. Uh, we're just getting started in this field. Uh, people are doing program comprehension for a long time, but now we have access to a lot better tools that really get at these almost like microsecond level cognition events that are happening, and then we can try to understand what's, what's going on. And with the affect sensors, we could figure out if those things are difficult for you, if they're easy for you, if the difficult things correspond to the things that we're looking where you say a part of the program is difficult, we could start learning some uh, we could start learning things about that, about that kind of code, and be able to maybe build some tools to make that easier in the future. So a lot of the work here shows up at ICPC, which is the Conference on Program Comprehension, uh, ICER, which is the Computer Education, Conf Education Research Conference, and ICSI, the Software Engineering Research Conference. But if you join, maybe something cool would come up, would come up at ICGSE, because that'd be kind of fun. Um, and look at different cultures and the way people read code or the way that people are feeling about their code. So I want to thank you very much. Um, it was great to talk to you today. And I'll take any questions right now. So thanks. Yep, Sarah. I'm getting closer to, so the question was whether, I will repeat the question. So uh, Sarah asked, are we getting any closer to understanding causation versus correlation in, in this kind of field? And I think the answer is yes, but everything looks incredibly complex. So we're like at this super basic level of research where we're just like, what does this sensor value mean? And then sure, like a hop, skip, and a jump, and maybe 15 other jumps away, I'll get to software engineering. <clears throat> but I kind of feel like I have to start pretty low. But I'm, it's very compelling. And I'm really, I like the idea, I really, really like the idea that this is something a software developer does, that I can trace whatever is wrong back to something that they did, and maybe do something about that. Follow up? Um, 
first I have a comment I have a comment related to the keyboard and the experiment that you are about to work on. Have you thought about white spaces? Because those are hit very often and you were trying to, to think which key, how, but white spaces are generally space and enter and control are very much used by developers and they are used often. So I was wondering whether you tried to map those two or whether so Paolo's question was about the uh, pressure-sensitive keyboard study and whether or not we are we should consider using uh, looking at just the subset of the keys that are maybe hit a lot more often, like the space bar or the control key, um, as a way to measure the stress since those are hit like far more often. And that's a, it's a fantastic idea. I will take that back and use that. Actually, there was a study um, that was presented at um, Coley Calling last year um, in Finland which is an education research conference for computer science. And they did a study where they looked at inter-key uh, <coughs> timing to figure out which student was taking your, your online test. Um, and they found that if they looked at the top most frequently hit pairs of keys versus the 3,500 possible pairs, they just looked at the top 50, that was enough to build a machine learning model to identify a student, which is awesome. So just looking at the most common things is, is probably a way to get around some of these problems. Yeah. So last night you told me don't bother coming to this talk. It's not going to be that interesting. I'm so glad I ignored your advice. <laughs> not only is this really cool, you know, and fun, but it's quite thought provoking. I know it's early days, but do you have anything that my proverbial practitioner can take back to his or her boss to say, yeah, it was definitely worth coming to ICDSE because this guy at Microsoft is really got an insight for us. That's a good question. So we're wondering what kind of, what is the, that's a common question. I seem to have heard that many times this morning. Um, <laughs> what should I take back to my practitioner fellows? Um, one thing that we found actually that practitioners seem to like is they really like shiny objects. Nobody likes them to, nobody likes it when a researcher comes up to a practitioner and says, you're doing this wrong. You should communicate better with your, with your friends in India. You should maybe have meetings at 7 p.m. or 7 a.m. so that they don't have to wake up at 2 in the morning to have your meeting. At least for Microsoft, we have bad time zones. Um, but they don't like to hear that. But what they do like is, I have a cool tool. You could try it out for us and wear this cool sensor, and I'll understand what's going on with your development activities. Um, or I can help you understand what's happening with your development activities. And that seems to attract their, them a lot. Whether or not they feel like they're getting any value of it, I don't think they're getting any value added directly. Fortunately, nobody else is either, so you can't really use this to judge somebody, uh, which is nice. Well, I do a lot of stuff to maintain people's privacy, and data doesn't leave their machine unless it goes into my, like my USB stick. Uh, but I do feel like they gathering more data from a lot of people will help a lot with the data collection. So there actually is a program out from uh, University of Eastern Finland now. They will give you. Uh, free use of an SMI eye tracker, which is normally $15,000, um, if you just had a bunch of people read some source code while using it and then send back the data. And so they've gathered about 250 <coughs> users so far, which is fantastic because typically in a study, maybe you can get 10 in your own university. But now to get like 250 from across the world means you actually have enough data to start doing statistical analyses. So that might be something just even to gather the data from a lot of people now gives us the corpora to then work on that and be able to analyze um, and find some real results. Peggy? Yeah, great talk, really uh, fascinating. Learned a lot today. Um, I wondered about um, if you could use some of this, I guess, sensor data to tell when to send a developer home. So a colleague of mine that works in a large company He'll actually notice when his developers look tired, or at six o'clock, he'll say, "Go home. I don't want your code in my, you know, in the repository when you're mm -hmm. this tired." So I wonder, have you thought about that? Could that be one application? I thought about something. So Peggy asked, "Could you tell when a programmer got tired enough to want to send them home that maybe they're not being affected that day?" I think that would be a really interesting application. You'd have to be incredibly careful about how that message came across. If it looked like it came from your manager, it might not be so good. Um, if it came from your computer acting on your own behalf. Yeah, that's what I mean. Right? Like, oh, it looks like your reading speed has gone down. Therefore, your productivity is going down. You're not typing at a fast rate now. This is 
not it's like work it's like personal process. it's like kind of like personal software process. I mean, I don't want it to end up being like, oh, the computer's noticed that you're too stupid to work on this bug, so we're going to reassign it to somebody else. So <laughs> that I'm not going to do. I don't think that's. I don't even think I could tell that. But it's, I meant, I meant but like more for personal kind for of personal, use. I think that yeah. could be helpful. And we're doing that for that kind of thing for health sensing. Um, so we try to correlate things like what did you eat for breakfast this morning and how, much, how many hours of sleep did you have for trying to figure out does this correlate with your mood later in the day. I have another question that maybe a little Okay, we'll go with Powell and then we'll go back to Peggy unless there's more questions from over here. Um, actually, Wakar has a question. Yeah, uh, Why don't we go with you first and then. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you very much for your fascinating talk. Really learned a lot as Peggy said. Uh, my question is, you, you are after looking uh, at the code as a whole. Well, I was thinking about why not categorizing code either, not either or actually, uh, into categories like which phase of the project they are in and whether they are working on a bug or a change. Because when you look at eye tracking, when you look, when you're looking at a code trying to understand where I can find the real bug or where am I going to hit the keys to implement the change. Will that give you some additional insight as to just looking at the code as a whole? So the question was, if we look at what the phase of development that you're in, like are you fixing a bug or are you making a change, can that, does that alter the way the patterns that people exhibit in their eye movements such that if I knew what they were tasks they were doing, could I understand it better? In fact, actually, knowing what tasks they're doing is almost required to figure out what their eyes are doing. Like I can figure out, I can make guesses at this very small time scale, like a couple seconds. But even watch, I've like watched software developers for three hours at a time, and I remember watching one for a half an hour. She sat there and copy and pasted code from her code into a Notepad buffer. And after half an hour of watching this, I was like, I kind of broke my whole, I'm just an observer, I don't touch people, but like I tapped her on the shoulder, I was like, why are you doing this? Like you've been copying and pasting for half an hour. And she's like, oh, I have a meeting with my manager in, in an hour and I need to show him the code I'm working on and ask him some questions. <laughs> I was like, oh, well that makes a lot of sense, but y you don't know that just from observing, like you actually have to somehow ask. So. I think in a lot of cases you do need to know the task and that you can infer sometimes from the bug database like if they go to a bug database in the morning to figure out what task they should work on that day or they go to a Kanban board and they look at the user study that they're working on that day, that can give you hints if you get access to that data to then interpret what's happening. So it might be a very multimodal type, type of study here, a lot of quantitative as well as quantitative type of data. Thank you. Um, let's go to Paolo and then back over here. You mentioned during the presentation that you looked uh, also into interoperability of software developers. Can you comment a bit more about on which kind of sensors and data you utilize to, well, you aggregate it to come up with the, with the level of interoperability and whether they were reliable or not? So um, the question was, <coughs> what sensors actually are good for detecting interoperability um, in software developers? So I didn't do that study, that was a mix of two people's ideas. So James Fogarty did a lot of work on interruptibility in office workers back in the, in the mid-2000s. And uh, I was thinking you could use that. If you could detect flow, then you could then apply that. Um, we have a couple different ways to detect, kind of like flow is a combination of attentiveness, arousal, and medium level of cognitive load. And in some of those cases, I can measure those things with a sensor, like I can measure arousal with the electrodermal activity sensor. I can get a little bit of the stress level from the keyboard or the, from the mouse, the way that people are gripping it. Um, flow, the, the cognitive load aspect, we seem to have trouble in me measuring it accurately without stopping you. So one of the ways that we've done it in the past is if you send somebody an instant message and you ask them to multiply two two-digit numbers together, and then go back to work. What you look at is how long did it take them, A, to do the multiplication, and more importantly, actually, how long did it take them to resume their task? Exactly. So the more cognitively loaded they are, the harder it will be to resume, because they have to get back into that state. The problem is that I stopped you from doing your task, which means I've kind of ruined whatever flow you were in. 
in order just to check, are you in flow state? Um, one of the things people do in driving simulators is they have a, a little LED they put on the dashboard. Um, and actually, real driving too. And they flash the LED at random times, and they ask you if you ever see a random, if you ever see the LED flashing, let me know. And you look at the time that it takes them to notice the LED. And the longer time it is, the more they're paying attention to the road, so it's occupying more of their attention. And so it's still invasive. It doesn't quite stop them because they at least they do any real driving. Um, so I don't think anybody got into a car crash, but. Um, at least at that point, you can start getting a slightly better measure. Um, there's another way to do it, which is with a better eye tracker. Um, the Toby one we have uh, is $100. They also make a $40,000 one, which is super nice. Uh, it's, it lives on the desk. It's its own computer. And um, it can measure pupil dilation. And it turns out that whenever you are looking at something that is difficult for you to understand, your pupils dilate a little tiny bit over normal. And this is like, if your pupils are normally between three and seven millimeters dilated, uh, this is like an extra half millimeters or somewhere between 0.1 and 0.5 millimeters. So it's super small change, but you can detect it. I've actually seen it happen when I had somebody to look at a function that had math in it, like return x times 13 plus y. Their pupil popped open a little bit and it was super cool to see it. I mean, great, I made a math detector, which wasn't the most exciting thing in the world because I don't know, it's just, I can tell when you're working on it. But um, we're still looking for better ways to kind of measure this kind of stuff. Um, did you have a question still? Yeah. I'm just wondering if you're seeing any differences in pattern between people reading code versus writing code. Is that important? Yeah, so we're not, not up to writing yet. Um, we just got to the ability to scroll <laughs> and, go, and go between different pages. I mean, the, speed, the, eye, the eye tracker just tells you literally an X, Y position on the screen. It has no idea about the content. So I put a lot of smarts into a Visual Studio plugin that actually understands not just like where on the screen you're looking, but like what was there. And it can deal with scrolling, it can deal with changing the file, and changing the code itself is harder because now you're changing your experiment like directly. Yeah, Marco? So thanks for talking and uh, that talk that, that gave me Actually, a good idea what, what other kind of use cases I could have in the, in the overall software development process uh, beyond just writing code. Um, when I think about quality assurance, for instance, so I mean, much, much work on quality assurance is focusing on how to improve unit testing, make unit testing better, and find another nanosecond more performance or shipping of unit testing to other sites in the GSE context. And that, that's direct uh, task supporting developers or testers. Uh, this sensor stuff, I think, is also a good thing um, to bring designers and end users closer together. Because when I have, for instance, an application, then I have the application also with a specific set of use cases in mind, which means that I also anticipate a certain user behavior. And that means that I could, for instance, design expected flows through an application, mm -hmm. exceptional flows, something like that. That's something that I can model. And with these sensors, when I wire up the, the users, I can see how good my prediction were, uh, uh, predictions were. And that, that could be a quite interesting approach to bring a bit more life into user acceptance testing instead of focusing on making unit tests faster or unit tests cleaner by supporting the developer in avoiding bugs. I mean, chasing bugs is only one part of quality mm -hmm. assurance. To, to figuring out uh, whether the user really accepts the stuff or, or gets stressed by using the application, maybe hates using the application. Mm -hmm. It could be an interesting sort of application. Yeah, so Marco was talking about using these sensors to measure the affect in other types of applications, um, especially in end user acceptance of applications or when you're doing acceptance testing, uh, different kinds of quality assurance. And those are great ideas. Um, some of them are being used in sort of the more uh, usability kind of studies. Um, certainly looking at uh, expected flow, like <coughs> is a person using the application as I expect using the eye tracking. Using the eye tracking, one of the eye tracking things uh, was used a lot to be able to tell that nobody ever looked past the second search result on a, on a web page in Bing. And so therefore you gotta make the, search, the first one really work. Um, so those are kind of helpful things you can use this stuff with. Um, last question. We have one last question. Yeah. Um, I think it's got two parts. 
Okay, no okay one question. Okay. Just one part. <laughs> right, the question is, um, have you tried to use this to see if documentation in code could help the readability? That means instead of them jumping back and forth, if it could be made more linear so that he just goes through the code and he kind of becomes self-understanding. And the second question was, how does the eye behavior work when you're under stress? It means you're given only half an hour to do the problem. So the question there was, does documentation in line with the source code make it any easier necessarily to read the source code versus if you have it elsewhere? <laughs> um, that would be a really fantastic study. Uh, it's a really great idea. Um, I encourage you to take a look at that. I will definitely put it on my list because that's awesome. Um, great idea. And then the second question uh, was all about whether stress affects how people's eyes move. Um, everything affects how people's eyes move. It turns out even just think aloud affects how your eyes move. Um, it turns out you can't even rely on timing that way. They have to be silent doing the experiment the exact way they would normally do it. And we do something actually called retrospective think aloud where we'll play back the eye gaze motion on a movie to them and ask them what they were thinking when they did that. Half the time they have no idea. Okay. A, they have no idea they did it. B, they rationalize it to us and they lie. And All they right. tell us they were thinking something when they didn't really think it. Um, and it's very entertaining sometimes in these studies, but it's hard to actually nail this stuff down. But stress definitely certainly will affect that. Thank you. All right, thanks very much, everybody. I really appreciate it.